Welcome everyone, this is Danny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're going to continue with the channeling series and today Carl is going to channel Carrie Mullis who is the uh, Nobel Prize uh, winning chemist uh, from Southern California. He passed away in 2019 and he's probably a little bit more famous now than he was when he was living because he's the fellow who developed the uh, polymerase chain reaction technique. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So anyway, that's his claim to fame, but he also did a lot of other things um, with respect to HIV, AIDS, and uh, had a, a parting in the ways, if you will, with a lot of the conventional knowledge around some of these things as, as, as they are promoted in big organizations like uh, World Health Organization and uh, Centers for Disease Control and outfits like that. So um, he also uh, wrote a book which I would love to read. I've seen some interviews of the fellow. He seems very engaging, very interesting person um, in a lot of ways. So we have six questions for him, or actually five questions for him today. And uh, with that, well, Carl and I will have a little discussion. You will have seen a little uh, bio about this fellow before you get to Carl and I, and that will kind of set the stage for our questions. So thanks for joining us, and thank you, Carl. And uh, welcome, everyone. Yes, and... <clears throat> A hearty welcome from me also to all you who are watching. We're, uh, we're on a tear to understand the universe and life and humanity and how it interacts with the divine realm and the reality of the divine and where our problems come from, because all of that figures in. We're in trouble for a good reason. We have a long, long history. And it's still rumbling, and it's still influencing today. And we're in a long-term contest between good and evil, as it turns out. And if you're going to do something with your time, I suppose there's probably nothing more worthy than that, because then you can be a good guy or a bad guy, and you get to have an interesting go-round, <laughs> not a kind of neutral one. This isn't, this isn't uh, an easy place to inhabit. There's many challenges. There's a few who kind of skate by and they're sort of like uh, the magical poster children of our dreams. We want an uncluttered, untroubled life and be happy and be successful and, and you know, secure and stable and all that, and have all the good things and some luxuries maybe. And, but for the average person, that is very elusive and there's many reasons why. And we're, we're wanting to know more about all of this and talk to people in the light to get some perspective on what is going on and why from the lens they bring in light of their time here because they were involved in things for and, and for one reason or another, we're curious about their story. What they can tell us now from having been here, done what they did, now they're back on a lofty perch, and they see the big picture. They know what's coming, and they know all of what's happened heretofore, and we don't because we're blind. We're really dimmed down and unaware largely because we lack a profound intuitive ability to see the future as well as review the past. Or, or we think we know things that actually aren't true. Well, there's a big part of that yeah. involved also. A lot right. of disinformation and misunderstanding and misinterpretation. And people with a lot of confidence in that. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there's no stronger opinion than the prejudiced will bring to the discussion. Yeah. You know, this is this is the, the, uh, the Achilles heel that everyone has because their thinking can be biased directly. So I don't want to start on a lecture now about mind control manipulation. That's really so. We'll let uh, Kerry Mullis touch on those aspects as he sees it is important to his story and the focus of our questions today. He's certainly an interesting fellow and made a profound contribution. This is a watershed event in science. What he did because it opened the door to so many things. As a working scientist in those days, um, I 
was amazed and delighted with this advent because I started to work with the fruits of that technology very quickly in a project I was involved with because it allowed us to manipulate the genome of microbes to make human proteins that were inflammatory mediators. And we were studying inflammation and looking for therapies to block it. And that technology allowed us to clone and manufacture um, and analyze and probe molecular entities and examine their properties. And it, it was, uh, it's a remarkable thing and will continue to be. And now there's so many applications. And ultimately we know because of what's been done by extraterrestrials that aging can largely be conquered through genetic research and understanding of the genome and the liabilities that creep into the, uh, to the genome. <clears throat> So it, it's not whether this is good or bad. That's a whole other discussion. But what I'm saying is there's a lot we can gain and will from this technology moving forward. So this is a big, big deal. Yeah. And then we have this pandemic that's using tests for this virus based on the PCR reaction, the polymerase chain reaction, which is a way to detect genetic material. That's how they're searching for the virus, looking right. for its actual genetic material. Yeah. Because it can be amplified from minuscule amounts to replicate and replicate till you can see it actually in a test yeah. tube. And then then you know, yeah, it's there. Yeah. So it's a it's a profound detection mechanism that among many other things. Mm -hmm. So so there's many implications for us. And and it always brings in moral and ethical questions, as well as the, the tension between science as it's used as a kind of religion, attempting to explain and rationalize everything, versus a spiritual perspective and belief to fill in those large gaps that still remain. Because if you can't embrace the idea of the divine, you only can get so far because the divine is real. So we know that, we believe that because of our resources and, and our study and research. So he's at this intersection in probing life itself in novel ways and doing it strictly from a scientific point of view. And so this, I think this will be interesting for maybe a number of standpoints. Yeah. Yeah. So because we'll, he, we'll see. It, it's it's going to be largely what the light wants us to know about these things, you know, always. Right. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I have, I mean, for having watched him and stuff and seeing, and seeing how his character in a lot of ways didn't really fit with our conceptions of what a scientist might be, his approach to things, um, I think in a lot of ways it seemed it was different than than what most of us would think of as like okay this is a, this is a scientific approach a scientific mode of thinking a scientific attitude kind of thing and he was he was kind of more of the uh, you know the cheerful ex hippie surfer guy <laughs> you know who you know I mean he, he, when you watch him and you listen to him you, and you hear him talk he didn't, didn't really fit the mold of what you would think of as a as a serious chemist working in, you know what I mean? So he, Oh, I do. He, yeah, he's a, he was a, uh, an interesting fellow, a quirky fellow. I could see how just from his mannerisms and his, his form of speech and stuff that he would be considered someone a little bit, um, outside the mold, if you will. Like, you know, I'm trying to picture him in, in a, some kind of medical conference. Everybody's sitting around in their suit and ties and here comes Carrie, you know, it's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I that 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 to me was very endearing. That that part of him was very endearing to me, um, but it may have very little to do with what what answers we get. Um, but I had fun, you know, getting to know him through the way I did on, uh, you know, getting ready and coming up with the questions and whatnot. So, 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like I say, we have five questions for them. Hopefully they're, they're kind of, they're a little bit lengthy questions, which I, I, I'm a little bit nervous about. I always check with Carl first because sometimes we can get, we can get lost with, uh, you know, big, big lengthy preludes or multiple part questions and stuff. And then you're left in the position of having to sort all that out while you're doing the channeling. And, uh, you know, maybe that would be, maybe th this would be a good time for you to explain to our, maybe some of our new viewers exactly what we're doing here. What are you doing in channeling someone like Carrie and what are the pitfalls and everything, you know, how is this even possible? Well, you're just reminding me how bizarre this is and how wildly <laughs> improbable this is. I had a 30-year career as a pharmacologist doing research to discover new medicines, and uh, now look at me. I'm talking to <laughs> spirits in the light right? Th through God, you know, as a channeler. And how does that happen? Well, that's another story, but... Rest assured, I'm still a scientist. That's how I think of myself. It, from the standpoint of someone just driven by curiosity, a burning curiosity about everything, and an inner drive to learn and grow and understand as best I can the unknown and even the unknowable. And that is, that is a, quite an impetus to, to keep at it. And so... I've always been that way, a kind of a dogged researcher. And, and so that's still my motivation. But now I'm doing it through the divine realm because I can have access. So I can go into a part of their mind, connect to creator of all that is. I call it creator to make it more generic so I don't have to choose between God and Allah and Yahweh and, and that sort of thing. Odin, you know, who, there's so many different ways of describing the almighty but even all the major wor uh, world religions believe the idea there is one god there is one ultimate holiest authority yeah a creator call being. what you will yeah. Yeah. yeah and it is the creator and so i do my channeling to go to creator to connect me to that subject whatever it is someone in the living and a discarnate spirit or a spirit in the light now, back home, but in a very lofty level and not in this lower astral plane that's near our energy and we're down in this density. So the idea is we're using consciousness to connect to other consciousness. That's all it is. Just like you and I are having this conversation, your mind formulating questions, you speak, I listen, my mind formulates an answer, etc. We're doing the same thing, except the consciousness is unusual in its origin. The target I'm seeking is no longer in the living. Yeah. Now, how can that be? Well, it turns out we're immortal. You can look this up in the Bible. You know, it's been around for 2,000 <laughs> years at least that we're all immortal. We have an immortal soul. That yeah, means so just, just what it says. We're just jumping from one unbelievable thing to the next unbelievable thing. <laughs> well, all, I'm, all I'm saying is I'm not trying to resort to the Bible for my defense. I'm pointing no, no. out. No, I know, but, a, I, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm empathizing with the situation here because in order to explain it, you have to propose – a bunch of things that, that most people generally don't believe, you know, so it's like, it's, I know it's hard. But it, and, it, and it's funny because what do those people think who are going to church every week that they're talking about? Yeah. They're talking about God in heaven. Yeah. Well, you know, who says I can't talk to God in heaven? Right. And maybe even get an answer if my radio right. is in better operating condition than theirs. You know, I can pick up God's messages better than they can well sorry you know <laughs> go work at it you know come back come down with a divine mission life plan to be a channeler then you know i mean this is what it is so but i'm just saying this isn't unprecedented an idea and it was actually one of the things that woke me up and started me more avidly towards a spiritual awakening myself, that when I left my formal scientific career and started learning things like hypnosis to help people with emotional problems by looking at the subconscious, 
because I felt that was a hugely neglected area and didn't understand it at the time. Right. Why that was so. And that led me to these other phenomena that others have noted, past life memories. And you can tap into it more readily through hypnosis. But what's that? You know, if you can go back again, the whole idea of evolution is is wildly improbable. How does that evolve? Right. That you can die and come back as the same person in another body, another time, and right. a place. You know, right. where are you in between? You know, yeah, it calls oh, into question the whole variety of things, a whole a priori assumptions that we all have that were you know inculcated into us before we could even speak. Yeah. yeah. But we are in a reincarnation paradigm. There's huge evidence supporting that. Right. All kinds of evidence supporting it. And when I can talk to spirits who leave the body and now they're floating around because they're dead, that is another validation of what I'm talking about. And when I can talk to them when they've made it back to the light and they're now up there with the divine, that's another yeah. validation. So you're, so you're see- talking about the validation through direct experience, not some little yeah, blips on a piece of paper somewhere. This is like something you did. Right. Yeah. And so... When I do this and I deal with people's loved ones and so on, and they tell me, oh, my goodness, you know, this was such a miracle because I I figured out really the backstory of what happened with with my husband, father, wife, whatever, because I was able to talk to them and get some feedback of reassurance. But I mean, this is an amazing thing. So anyway, um the idea here is we want a higher, deeper truth about some things we think are useful to understand, and we're going to go for it. And uh, we'll we'll see what happens. And you watching can decide for yourselves. You know, are you in or are you out? Yeah. We're still on the fence, and it's up to you. I'm not here to twist anybody's arm. Yeah. But uh, I hope for an awakening for more people because it's very, very needed. That's what this is all about. Okay, well, let's let's see what Carrie has to say. All right, so I'll do my thing to get in the state of consciousness I need, connect with Creator to set up safety around the work. Very important. Most channelers don't do that and end up talking to an imposter. Most are being duped. Most are channeling an extraterrestrial psychic, actually, who is feeding them warmed-over spiritual beliefs and practices and ideas from all through the ages. They know all about our spirituality and they feed it back to us as a kind of pablum with a lot of encouragement and happy talk, sweetness and light, but never real serious discussions or warnings about problems or how to solve them. That's the difference. So if you think we're dark, it's because we're doing our homework and we're talking about the real world. Those other channelers are not. They're talking about some glorious future that isn't here yet. Right. And might never come un- right. unless we can solve our problems first. So that's the wake up call here. So I will connect to Kerry and he will announce when he's on board. Okay. Thank you. This is Kerry Mullis speaking. Thank you for joining us. Did you successfully transition upon your death, and what were your expectations about your passing? I was not expecting anything would be there to greet me. I was expecting oblivion. And in a sense, I got what I was expecting in leaving the body, I found myself alone in the dark, alone, and in a kind of stifled existence. It's difficult even to describe the profound emptiness represented by the darkness of having consciousness naked and alone with nothing to connect to that makes any sense or provides any kind of expanded awareness than thought alone. 
when you are thinking, you are still encased in a physical body. It is alive. It is breathing. Your heart is beating. You sense where your position with respect to gravity. Your body is touching surfaces, whether lying or sitting or standing even. You're in touch with the earth. You're physically perceiving the environment around you. How much light is in the room with you. What the air temperature is like. On and on, there is a sense of being a part of something larger. Becoming an earthbound spirit, which is what happened to me, left me disconnected totally. The closest description we could give to you from the perspective of what humans conceive of as being in the nothingness is to be buried alive, put underground and covered over unable to move, unable to breathe, totally encased in darkness that is immovable and with no hope of escape, trapped forever in actuality. That is the perception of being earthbound for many. Some who retain Awarenesses of energy might find they are able t- to navigate a bit with their intention and may be carried through that interaction to reach loved ones and bump into their energy. It's not they will see them and picture them and interact with them in a meaningful way, but only there is a proximity brought about through their thought and feelings. There are feelings still. The feelings generated from the body are not strictly the product of nerve activity and hormonal release and neurotransmitter changes. Those are but a surface manifestation and end consequence of the feeling. It is consciousness generating the feeling that is expressed through the body chemically and electrically and genetically, eventually, in the growth of consequences and changes in gene expression, when there is a chronic change underway for the person to grow and heighten their sensitivity about something, the strength of their convictions and their need to identify and be a champion of an idea, or to protect the self and loved ones and is under siege and then becomes a vigilant warrior and so on. So feelings are possible even in a discarnate spirit and in a sense are magnified because they are the only experiencing available to thought, disconnected, from the environment totally. This is a dilemma of incompletion that is a product of disbelief. It is the penalty for the disbeliever to not expect a reunion with God when one passes and anything lofty and purposeful or a continuation of existence. I was blessed in being rescued from that plight 
by your efforts with the Lightworker Healing Protocol, which enabled divine healing for me to raise my inner equanimity sufficiently that my perception of outside energy was enhanced. And that was enough for me finally to see the outreach energetically by the light callers sent from the divine to greet me and take me back home to the higher heavenly realm. That was the greatest of blessings in my experience. Because the greatest of deprivations is to be cut off from the divine. This is the folly of the atheist, because you are cutting off your lifeline and all sources of love when you do that. The second best thing is to be around fellow humans because some of them still are able to receive love from the heavenly realm and express it through them to you and others as a kind of replenishment a nurturing, a nourishment through the sharing of love that keeps things going in a bleak existence of disconnection. That is the human dilemma, that you are of God, literally an extension of creator's consciousness, giving you your very existence and ability to move about freely under your own desires, and free will, but find yourself launching into a human incarnation, starting over with no recollection consciously of your origin, who you are, what life is all about, and at first unable to even operate the human body in any willful, purposeful fashion. That is restarting from behind, and it is a huge challenge for the young. And it leaves the mind on hold for a long, long while. And only by chance will you encounter the knowledge you truly need to advance and grow, and in particular, make a contribution of some kind to human understanding, leading to human betterment. This is why you are all here. You are here to change the world for the better, to save and heal the world and save and heal other worlds. How are you doing? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you may not really yet have started. There is much to do. You are still behind. You started from behind, and you are still behind, and you will end up behind unless you pay attention and listen carefully to what we tell you. Give it its due consideration and open your mind and your heart to possibilities because what we will tell you is the truth. Okay, thank you. You reported that you came up with the breakthrough regarding the PCR technique while driving from Berkeley to Mendocino, where you had a cabin. While traveling along that dark road, you solved the most annoying problems in DNA chemistry in a single lightning bolt, where where your discovery of PCR has been credited with transforming genetic and forensic research in diagnostic medicine. Now it is being used to determine basic freedoms, one of which is the right to travel and extending into other areas such as employment. 
The polymerase chain reaction or PCR technique is being used to determine whether or not someone can infect another with what is known as the COVID-19 virus. Some say this flies in the face of logic and is a complete misapplication of the PCR technique. Now that you are a light being, what do you say? There is much to ponder here and much to dissect. We will touch on the key issues only because these are deep subjects with many deep implications. The first thing you asked about is the insight I had, which led to this breakthrough scientifically. We can tell you unequivocally because we see it clearly and can review it over and over. One of the capabilities of light beings to understand where they've been and what took place because everything is on file. Everything in life is being recorded. This has many values. It is a reference system for assigning responsibility used as a kind of enforcement arm of the divine to reckon with mistreatment of others, any maldoing, causing harm, disrupting the flow of love. So who is responsible is brought to account with a request and then a demand for a restoration, a payback of a karmic debt incurred by wrongdoing. That as well provides the milestones of one's life so that one can do a retrospective analysis in exquisite detail of everything that transpired and all of the consequences it represents. When you have a review of your life, when you return one day to be with me, you will replay your life literally as an exercise to learn and plan your future. Because you will want to know yourself what you gained and what you lost with respect to all other forays into life in the physical. Most people have lived hundreds of lifetimes, most of which ended in tragedy or failure of some kind, and for which they have a karmic obligation to bring healing still all in service to the light in the attempt to raise the level of discourse, elevate the culture, and help humanity learn enough from past mistakes to do better. And through that gradual enlightenment, have a gain in the contest between good and evil. All of that depends on being able to see the past as well as appreciate the future that is being created constantly through everything that takes place. So the idea of being in tune with one's life mission is all important in that context because those were goals that are a kind of sacred pact made with the self and with the Almighty and with due consideration to the human family because you are an integral member. Everything you do affects them and vice versa. There is always more at stake in things than you appreciate. 
about your existence. Even if you are living as a hermit, you are influencing the human family, if nothing else, by that choice alone. You are allowing a gap to occur with respect to the interactions and the assistance possible to give one another and so on. What I enjoyed in my makeup, if not deeply in my inner convictions philosophically, was a freedom of thought because I was imbued with a high level appreciation for there being something greater than human. I had that all my life and very much so as a youngster. And as often happens, was not able to understand it and funnel it into a purposeful exercise of some kind to allow development of a deep spiritual growth that would be meaningful by being valid, but was nonetheless open to inspiration. This is something that is somewhat inexplicable because inspiration is thought to be a misnomer in the sense of inspiration meaning in spirit, in alignment with spirit, in the spirit presence, in a mode where one receives a spirit communication. All of that is dismissed by the cynical view of science, disbelieving entirely in all the phenomena and the implications involved. Good ideas do not arise in a vacuum. If you think about this, you can see the folly of the very notion that someone can sit down and on their own conceive of something grand and miraculous whose existence was never known and never explained to you either. This is more than creativity, a lucky guess, or a novel extrapolation simply by having the kind of mind that holds on to lots of information and so has lots to work with and can put together a novel conception because all those building blocks happen to be present within this individual. And then there is just an artful solving of a puzzle. That happens routinely with creativity on a normal creative level for those capable of intellect in that fashion. What we are speaking here, and this is being an example, is divine inspiration. When the mind of the Almighty touches you for a time and brings into your awareness the outline of something never before conceived, this may come directly from creator, or it might be via your higher self in collaboration with creator, because your higher self is there to help guide you, after all, and does much of this kind of prompting and suggesting and encouraging and occasionally a nudge or a reminder to not forget something you had in your thought once, but then let go of because it didn't sink in. 
the divine realm might bring those things back around to you until you get the point. But you must be open and allowing for that to happen. That was my gift, the gift of intellectual openness, so that the divine was able to walk through that crack in the door I left open. I was not actively seeking it, other than I knew ideas come from somewhere, and I wanted to be in tune, even with the greater reality, to the extent that might lead to something. Because people talk in those terms. The idea of meditation, and then ideas come to you, and so on. The use of psychedelic substances to open up the, the mind itself to be keener and more greatly sensitive and a kind of creativity fostered by a sort of inner fireworks ramping up the energetics and so on can favor picking up something that might be reachable but more difficult under ordinary operating conditions. So in whatever way, we often seek something to come, maybe because we're struggling with a dilemma. It might be a serious one, a life-threatening one, or in the case of a scientist, the drive of inner curiosity. I was inspired to make the links needed to solve a problem in the chemistry of the gene makeup and how it can be manipulated to be revealing of the sequence of the building blocks of the genes themselves the nucleotides that construct a precise sequence that has a chemical consequence and constitutes a chemical signature representing information. And most directly, the information needed to create the very building blocks of life itself in the form of a physical organism and its component parts, including the genetic apparatus and machinery of information content, the DNA, as well as the RNA as an interplay and twin in how information is directed from the genomic repository in the nucleus of a cell through ribosomes to construct proteins needed to comprise the body and as servants in exchanging instructions to make things happen. The so-called physiological mediators, things like hormones that are released and float through the bloodstream to distant organs and tissues as a signaling and a way of communicating instructions and so forth. To understand the genome and make something of it requires scholarly probing. The, the block at that time when I had this breakthrough insight was in having a way to deal with very tiny amounts of DNA and know what one was working with and to amplify it in a way that it could both be studied to determine the nucleotide sequence as well as to produce more quantities if desired because there are many uses for that as well. I was divinely inspired to have this breakthrough and have told the story, as alluded to in your question, on a car trip 
through the mountains in a kind of meditative reverie behind the wheel. This opened my intuitive gateway to be in a partnership with my higher self. And I was given a nudge from my higher self, which rightly saw I was probing all around the edges of the solution. And what the higher self was doing was pulling together those individual threads and showing how they could be woven together in a next step, which was the genesis of this idea. It was because I created the threads that that could be offered to me as a kind of reward through my mind yearning for growth, yearning for a kind of breakthrough in understanding and a creative extrapolation, a kind of leap of logic to generate a bold new perspective. In that sense, this is literally the answer to a prayer. It was not that I was an active church-going, Bible-carrying believer in the Almighty. It was because I was a divine human in need expressing a very deep soul yearning in a way that was functionally capable of allowing an information exchange, namely, in a meditative state, to use my intuitive apparatus, and was not corrupted to an extent. I was more in alignment with the darkness than with the light. What this speaks to is, those are the criteria that are important. The religious person might speak of it as partnering with God and not the devil, being in alignment with the light rather than the darkness is another way of saying one is in divine alignment and not in a state of withdrawal and a distortion of that confluence. Most people are corrupted to varying degrees. This is inevitable because it is seen to, it is actively done to you through all kinds of manipulations. It is rare people are unfettered and open to new possibilities. That is why I had this breakthrough, because I was enough above the fray by standing strong and not giving in to the negativity of corruption that I was still in good enough shape to be reachable by the divine to inspire me. So this is an object lesson for others. And this is the way all great innovations come about. Humans are capable of creativity. If they create something on their own, it will be less magnificent, less lofty, and less beautiful than if it comes through a partnership with the divine directly. Keep in mind that as an extension of the divine, some of that divinity will find its way even into less lofty pursuits. This is why a stage performer of rock stars, who in effect are carrying out a satanic ritual 
might have impressive and somewhat artistic and beautiful trappings. After all, everything is of divine origin in its conception. It is only that the execution can become distorted through an inner disarray of consciousness by individual portions out and about on their own, especially when they don't remember where they come from and what their sacred mission happens to be and are left on their own and not warned in particular about the workings of evil and their vulnerability. And then things proceed from there. This innovation of the PCR, polymerase chain reaction, has contributed much to scientific advancement. For one thing, this took place with divine encouragement and would never have happened without it. Because an, an understanding of the workings of genetics are jealously guarded by the extraterrestrials who are controlling your world. It is their key to mastery in their own civilizations and the source of their power and control of other worlds. They do not appreciate even the extent of all that it represents and all that it impacts and how it functions. And not at all its divine origins and workings because they themselves are corrupted to be disbelievers. And as atheists, they are sorely limited in true power. They have power over the physical realm. That is a low-level accomplishment. So in the workings of the chemistry of genetics, the PCR has been a genuine contributor on multiple levels, one of which is in diagnostics. Put simply, it can find a needle in a haystack. By knowing what needles look like and how they're comprised, one creates a kind of chemical probe to seek the needle. And when the needle is found, there is a built-in intelligence of a sort to see to its amplification, to essentially make a whole bunch of other needles. What this means is, if you want to know if a haystack has a needle, and you send this probe in, sooner or later, you can take a sample of the edge of the haystack and you'll find one of the needles that is a replicate through the amplification. And then you'll have your answer, either yes or no, as the case might be. Because if there is no needle present, there is nothing to amplify. When you're dealing with things like whether someone is infected by a virus, where the actual genetic material of the virus is scant, almost vanishingly small in concentration, it might be a few particles distributed across the surface of cells. It is such a tiny amount of material 
to begin with, it is invisible to the eye and to most ways of probing. Even using the most powerful microscopes, it is a daunting challenge to see a few scattered viral particles. And then one will not know their nature. What kind of virus is it? Is it something common in the environment and in the biome of aggregated life forms that dwell on the surface of the cells in the orifices of the body and deep within, as in particularly the the GI tract, but also in the lungs and in other tissues as well. There are many viruses that have taken up residence and co-inhabit the body. Many are pathogens and being held in abeyance. Some are simple tagalongs acquired through ingesting other life forms and material from the environment. But in any event, wanting to know, is there a dangerous virus present? You need a tool that is powerful enough to see the minuscule and tell you quickly whether it is there. There is no time to culture out a virus, which is a fragile and by no means certain way of telling. In order to save someone's life, to know when they might need to start treatment because something serious is happening, or they need to quarantine to help protect their loved ones, and others in society. So there are compelling reasons to check on the status of a person, given what we know about pandemics. And much of the battle is in taking preventive measures. If vaccines are available, but not universally in enough quantity, knowing where an infection is starting and spreading most rapidly provides valuable tactical intelligence to where you need to focus the vaccination efforts. This is done routinely in public health measures around the world. When there is an outbreak of a deadly virus like Ebola, for instance, to send in medical teams forming a ring geographically around that location and start to work on that area to protect the people so that it cannot spread, at least more widely. So there are many practical benefits in checking the status, whether someone is exposed and developing an infection and discriminating that from other similar viruses that may overlap in their symptoms. That too is of great value because the COVID-19 virus is highly infectious and more so than a number of other coronaviruses in which it is a family member. This is not a perfect approach. It is an approximation. It is a useful adjunct. It is not an absolute approach because it is not applying a decision, it is applying a way of gathering certain information. As the saying goes, the devil is in the details, and that is how one uses the information, to what end, in what way. 
this technology is appropriate for the intended purpose, but it is being applied in an inappropriate way that favors a huge number of positive results that raises undue concern about the spread of the virus and the vulnerability of those who test positive and the implications for society as well as politically in actions taken in an attempt to thwart the reach of the epidemic. This all relates to the way in which government is being used as a tool of the darkness to increase the negative impact of the advent of this new pathogen. Given that its origin is not natural, but artificial, this tells you everything you need to know. It is an actual bio-warfare agent developed in extraterrestrial laboratories and spread around the world deliberately by minions of the extraterrestrial alliance. This is done largely by corrupted human beings. Given a false story, they are doing something useful to save the world and are ignorant about the true purpose of their activity. They are victims as well because they will karmically be held to account for their actions, even though manipulated. It is a partial mitigating factor to be an instrument corrupted and constrained unwittingly by the darkness. But karma holds you to high standards. You are supposed to be in divine alignment and above the fray and incorruptible. The extent to which you are not speaks to your inadequacy, your dishevelment, your state of incompletion and vulnerability. And if you are not working on that, you are shirking your sacred duty to safeguard your soul. These are the hard lessons of life. Everything counts. Everything matters. This is your world and your life to make of it what you can. And you will be judged and judge yourself by those standards, not to receive a punishment, but a burden to make restitution. So this will be paid by you if you falter, and particularly if you do something against the future of humanity as a collective. There are many working against humanity right now at all levels of society because all institutions are corrupted to be that way. This is particularly true of the healthcare system and particularly so at the governmental level, because that's where power resides to set policy. The purpose of this pandemic was, first of all, to engineer an economic collapse. That is being done more by the government than the virus. And the reason is the divine realm has been attenuating the impact of the virus to make it less lethal and in many cases of infection being non 
symptomatic. And essentially helping the person maintain their normal lives. Without divine intervention, it would be a hugely lethal and devastating setback for humanity. Nonetheless, because the plan is for economic destruction, The governmental authorities are being manipulated to treat this like the Black Plague with severe and draconian restrictions, with universal masking, social distancing, quarantining of individuals, and discouraging all public gatherings. And things like school attendance and many, many businesses going under because children need to grow and will, with or without learning, taking place. The latter is much less desirable, of course. And if businesses go under, they may never come back. Once the money is gone, people will lack the wherewithal to start up once again. This will leave a hole. And to the extent it is encouraged to happen by government heavy-handed restrictions can be devastating. This is the political overlay that is obvious and much talked about, but seen through a political lens leads to a divisiveness with politics as the point when that is beside the point. What matters is human survival in all respects, not only protection from an infection and its consequences, But economic survival, survival of the culture, survival of people being able to still work together and pull together and accomplish great things for the community they live within and the broader arena. That is getting lost in the shuffle, and it is not an accident, and it is not appropriate. When you want to kill flies with a hammer, what do you think is most likely to happen? Will there be a greater body count of dead flies? or things that are broken from hammer blows. Including some people, including ill health, suicide, mental illness, and the consequences of stress to the body, spawning all kinds of long-term chronic maladies that will be life shortening because people are put through a kind of hellish existence courtesy of government oversight that goes too far. This is not a small thing. One of the things that serves their agenda is the very PCR test made possible through my discovery when it is done in an oversensitive fashion to pick up the merest traces of virus that might be present or even a false positive from the presence of other coronavirus material. This adds to the problem by magnifying the seeming plight of humanity with huge numbers of new cases surging seemingly 
when at least a portion of that it is an exaggeration from two standpoints. It will pick up many, many individuals who have been exposed to the virus, but not sufficiently to cause a frank, observable, symptomatic illness. But using an extremely sensitive and exquisitely powerful detection tool like PCR, those people will be identified and considered cases. They will never be symptomatic or needing hospitalization or in risk of dying because their illness might already have ended. But nonetheless, the vestiges and viral remnants, even of non-living viral particles and aspects of the makeup of the virus as fragments will still be discernible. This serves the darkness by magnifying the seeming distribution and sheer volume of affected individuals. This adds greatly to fear, which allows the government to do its worst because the fear of death is hanging over everything and people are cowed by that and intimidated. And it seems selfish to an extreme degree. If one wants to keep one's bar or restaurant open because they want to make money while a pandemic is raging and people might become infected and die even if that business is open as usual. This is how it is framed for the average person to justify the lockdowns which are killing as many or more individuals as the virus in terms of lethality, in terms of morbidity, the suffering, and other consequences financially, and in terms of future quality of life because of all the ways lives are derailed, thrown off balance, delayed, and opportunities missed that will never come again are unknowable, but enormous in their impact and magnitude, given their influence across the lifetime of those who have been affected. This is no small thing. So the PCR and E and the PCR diagnostic tests are not to blame in and of themselves. You need to blame the people who designed them to be ultra sensitive, thinking wrongly an abundance of caution is needed under these dire circumstances, when in fact what they are doing is putting you in harm's way through that abundance of caution to justify other kinds of lethality. This is not the consequence of stupidity or the lack of intelligence and insight and savvy on the part of the scientists. It is a consequence of mind control manipulation to simply discount common sense in service to an inner fear and adopting a poor strategy in service to a faulty notion. That is how this has gotten going. 
and it will be very difficult to rein in. In hindsight, it might well be given consideration and written about, but that will be little comfort to all the billions of people whose lives have been changed forever as a consequence of the way things were distorted by over-interpreting the magnitude of the pandemic and its demographics. This great sensitivity is a function of the way the tests are constructed, specifically with regard to the number of replications allowed to take place in the amplification of the signal. What is most important to know is who is actively infected by a dangerous level of virus sufficient to cause symptoms and to make that person infectious to others and thereby spread the virus to unwitting victims they might encounter or spend time with at work or in their own home. Setting the sensitivity of the test to such an exquisite extreme that even a viral remnant will be picked up thwarts that purpose by creating a false positive in a functional sense. It is not false in the fact there might have been a live viral particle in that person at one time but you're not even sure of it. Having set the sensitivity to such an extreme that even a tiny remnant will give you a positive reading. The more cycles of amplification that are used, the greater the sensitivity, the more the minuscule amount of a viral particle remnant will be amplified enough to trip the test to a positive will happen. The number of cycles used in the majority of tests is significantly higher than that recommended by the Centers of Disease Control. What is wrong with this picture? Should the right hand be talking to the left hand during a pandemic, when government agencies are charged with the oversight in its management through public health measures? But this is what has taken place. It is being discussed, but action taken? That is an open question. We have already stated the reasons why such things happen. People are not thinking and acting normally. It is not allowed. The Extraterrestrial Alliance does not want humans interfering with their bio-warfare. It is that simple. Science is heavily manipulated and corrupted in many, many ways at all levels. This is intended as a means to hold back human progress. Why should the arena of germ warfare be any different. It is one of the most heavily corrupted and managed and misdirected scientific arenas because it is the playground of the interlopers who wish to harm you. Okay, thank you. I think you've already answered this question. I'm going to ask it anyway in case there's anything you want to add. 
You were quoted in Esquire magazine as saying, quote, the never-ending quest for more grants and staying with established dogmas, unquote, has hurt science. We now know, through the other channeling subjects and other inquiries via Carl's channeling work, that the problem with science goes much deeper. How were your notable insights confirmed or revised when you became aware of the larger picture as a light being? 